Hello, families. My name is Taylor Stanley. Uh, I'm the Family Engagement Specialist for DC Public Schools. I'm really excited to uh, join with you all today. Uh, I'm a parent, and so these tips um, I think I plan on using in the long run. Um, I have a one and a half year old, so I'm really excited to learn some of these tips early, but I'm glad that you all are joining us. Um, we have a great presentation today, and um, you know, as we have launched into summer, you know, reading is fundamental. And so keeping those skills and, and developing those skills is going to be really key this summer. Um, a little bit about how to use um, Microsoft Teams. Um, for those of you all who aren't familiar, Microsoft Teams is how our, um, our students have been learning through uh, distance learning. Um, and so if you have used it, Great, if you haven't, uh, you're getting a little bit of a sense of um, how we've been engaging with our students throughout um, social distance learning um, and the tools that, some of the tools that were used. Um, we do have subtitles available. Um, so what you can do, um, uh, if you look for the gear icon um, in the bottom right corner of the video player, uh, select the captions and subtitles, and then you can choose the language that you want. Um, and so this is a way for us to be able to engage more people um, and for people to feel um, like that we are being responsive to the many languages that we have throughout the city. Um, another piece about Microsoft Teams is that we have a Q&A feature. Uh, this allows you to ask us questions, uh, make comments, uh, suggestions, interact with us. It is a moderated Q&A, so we may not be able to post every question or comment, but uh, for the sake of the flow of conversation, but we do want to make sure that you are feel engaged through the Q&A section. One of the things that you'll see is as other families uh, comment on the Q within the Q&A, you'll see the, the thumbs up sign, and that's a way to upvote the questions so that we can tell what what topics or questions that a lot of people who are participating have. Um, so please use it to share insights that you might have. We do ask um, that you assume uh, best intentions. You go hard on ideas, not on people, and then also that you accept non-closure. We're not going to be able to answer every single question about early literacy, although I think Emily definitely has the knowledge base to be answered to be able to answer those questions but we are confined to an hour or more um a little bit more, maybe a little bit more but we want to make sure that we're able to answer the most questions as possible which is why um the upvoting piece is is really key so with that said, I'd love to introduce you all to Emily Hammett. She's the director of uh, elementary language arts. She is absolutely phenomenal to work with. Um, so I am going to hand it over to Emily because you all don't want to hear anything else from me because I can't tell you guys how to teach your kids to read, but Emily can. Um, so Emily, whenever you are ready to share your screen. Yes. And perfect. Here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Taylor, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Emily Hammond. I'm really happy to be here um, working with you all today. I'm hoping to provide you with some tips and tools to support early um, reading development for your children. Um, so let's get started. Um, so as Taylor shared, we're using um, Teams today for the presentation and also, um, you know, we'll use the Q&A as a sort of chat. Um, if you have um, the ability to get some paper and pencil together, that would be awesome so that you can take notes during the presentation. Um, Taylor has been so kind to create um, a resource that will have all the links that I mentioned today. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, as we go along, you can take notes um, as you need. I also have support um, behind the scenes from um, my colleagues, um, Elizabeth um, Barrett-Thompson, who's part of my team, and um, Brianna Pitts, 
who's also um, a part of our team. And I do want to mention Jerry because he's our fabulous um, producer working all of the magic in addition to Taylor. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, so if you haven't done so already, um, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. I know that there is a, an announcement with this information in there, but if you can just share your name and the school that your child um, or children attend along with their grade levels, you don't have to share any personally identifying information, um, just a feel of, of who's in the room. Um, and also, if you can share at least one takeaway um, that you're hoping for our time together, this will help me with making sure that I'm meeting um, the needs that, that you have. So let's take about a minute um, your name, your child's school or children's schools, um, their grade levels, and what is one takeaway that you have for our time together today? I'm going to take a look as they come in. We have some Tyler Elementary School representation. School Without Walls at Francis Stevens. My colleague um, Elizabeth is, is a, a Francis Stevens um, alumni. Peabody, right? Janny, all right. Marie Reed in Lafayette, Hearst. If you'll keep those coming in, um, I'm gonna move us along, but I'll definitely come back and check out um, who else is, is here with us today. So a Twitter highlight, I personally found this um, um, hilarious and though I, have, um, I don't have any children, I do work um, with um, some folks that do and so this is, one of the things that I have found incredibly um, funny about our time together, and that is um, <laughs> doing some math. If you have three kids and they wake awake, they are awake roughly 13 hours in the day, and you're trying to work from home. How many times will you hear the word snack? I don't know if you can relate to this, but just from hearing and being in conversations with my colleagues, I can definitely um, hear the folks asking for snacks. Um, and so I can only imagine um, your experiences with that over time. Um, so not only um, in taking an increased part in your child's education over this time, I, I also know that that you're taking very good care of your children, of course, as well, um, and providing them with all those snacks that they're asking for. Um, I just want to ground us in the fact that um, in DCPS, like we have a strategic plan and, and, and COVID hasn't changed um, our plan for our students. We have two very large goals. Uh, we have six <laughs> goals, but we have two very large goals that, that impact my work directly. Um, so we have our early literacy goal of 100% of our students in K2 reading on or above grade level, but we're also focusing in on um, making sure that our students um, are college and career ready um, with a focus on at-risk students and students of color um, being college and career ready. So early literacy is the precursor for that um, college and career readiness that we are looking for um, for our students. In DCPS, we have an early literacy theory of action, and this theory of action um, basically pulls together all of our stakeholders and how all of our stakeholders working together can support our students um, reading on or above grade level um, by the end of second grade. So I wanted to really call out that we do see families as literacy partners, um, especially in a time when they are learning at home, um, that you are so pivotal in the learning um, that your, your child does, your children do um, at home, and especially early readers, um, you're gonna be so pivotal, pivotal in their success. 
So we have a very simple um, goal today, and that's just practical learning at home ideas that are going to um, support and strengthen your, your children's um, reading skills. I wanted to share um, this thought. And so I think oftentimes as adults, um, and especially ad adults that are, are fluent readers, we often forget that reading is not a natural process. Um, we are wired to speak. We think about like when your children started, started to talk um, and they've been talking ever since, but the same is not true for reading. Reading is a human made skill and we, our brains haven't, evolve to really be able to do that like on its own. We have to learn how to read. So in remembering that we really need to learn um, how to read words on the page, I want you to think about like when you're looking at the text, when you're looking at this PowerPoint, like how do you get meaning from it? So the first bullet says you need to convert written words into speech. So that's me reading directly from what the text says, like looking at each of those those words and being able to say them. Now, it can be speech that's inside my head. It can be speech that you hear me read out loud, but we need to be able to read those words. We also be able have to be able to understand the words that we've read. So I have to make meaning from what has been read. So if we thought of words like pictures, our children would need to know 50,000 different pictures to be able to communicate. But because we have an English, which is an alphabetic language, um, English has 44 sounds or phonemes um, that we're gonna learn a little bit about. And for our children to um, be successful at reading, they need to know the sounds of English. So we're going to try it out for our first activity. Um, if you can't decode the symbols in a sentence, then you can't read. So even if you know the language, this is a sentence that's written in English. So, or that is English. Um, it's just not the same alphabet that we know. I'm gonna orient you to how we're gonna decode that sentence. So first it's important to know that this sentence is written from right to left. Okay, let's say it one more time. It's written from right to left. Since it's written from right to left, that's going to be very important in how you decode the sentence. With the code that's on the screen, the sound is on its left. So what sound does it make? You'll notice that it that they correlate to many English um, um, alphabet letters, but they're the sounds that it'll make. And just to give you kind of a hint, to make sure like what sound that particular letter is making because in English, some of these letters are making more than one sound. You'll see how the sound is pronounced in the column to the right. So we have the sound, we have the character, and then we have how it's pronounced. So for instance, um, the very first character um, in the top left is pronounced at ah, like at. So what I like you to do is using that paper and pencil, I would like for you to decode this sentence. Remember, reading from right to left. Let's do one together. On the last, the very last, um, all the way on your right, character, that character correlates to the same, or the sound that you hear in cat. So if you look, you'll see that that character says k, like cat, okay? So if you'll write that down on your sheet of paper, we are going to take three minutes to quietly work out what this sentence says. Now, you can share it in the Q&A once you have worked out what the sentence says, okay? So three minutes, I'm gonna mute myself and come back one time.
right, I'm seeing some initial responses. And as those um, are coming in, I also wanted to share that we also have parents here from walk-ins and I also saw Oyster. I apologize if I missed anyone. All right, so I saw some of this in the chat. So make sure my timer doesn't go off. Kit ran and hid. Yes. So those folks that shared in the chat were right. Kit ran and hid. So I want you to take a minute to think about how you normally read and what it took to decode this sentence. And think about what your children are, are doing when they're decoding as well. So, there we go. Um, I mentioned that you needed to not only decode, but that you had to have meaning from what you decode. So if you'll take a moment to read the um, a couple of sentences that are on um, the slide, we have to not only decode, but we need to understand what we're reading as well. So take a moment to read and let me know what you get from this. Like what understanding might you have after having read this? England's openers labored 34 balls before scoring their first boundary as Strauss cracked two fours through the leg side. Cook made a patient start before motoring past his skipper. Thoughts on what this is about? If you do, if you can put it in the chat or the Q&A. A sports game, okay. Sports game, there's some context there to get us thinking that this is about sports. Anyone know the sport that they're mentioning? I see two folks that say cricket. All right, before I read this, I had no idea that this was about cricket. Yes, cricket is the sport that this is mentioning. So to be able to understand this passage, I had to not only decode it, but I also had to have some background knowledge about um, sports and about um, the type of sport. So reading for our children doesn't just come from the ability to call the words, because you know we can all say the words really nicely, but also from understanding like what do those words mean? So what does the vocabulary mean, and like what does that content mean? Like those things together are what reading is. So that's what we need to work to support um, our students and children with. So when students are first learning to read, they spend a lot of time thinking about like the spoken language, right? They have lots of words in their vocabularies that they can um, use to speak with you and communicate to others, but just the words and letters are really strange. So in the middle of the page, it's kind of like what it looks like. They're not sure, you know, what this is, but we see the words as this is because we've learned to decipher the code. The best way to help students with starting to read is to get them to decode words, um, teaching them what the sounds are in the letters. Um, one of the biggest predictors for how well students will do in their first, first couple of years of school is phonemic awareness. So if you have um, your children that are in um, some of our schools are probably experiencing something called Hegarty um, phonemic awareness curriculum. And it's a focus on uh, phonological awareness skills. And so the sounds that are, are live in words, but kind of detached from the actual sight of a word. Um, phonemic awareness is a precursor uh, and a necessary skill prior to being able to attach um, the sounds to, to letters. So let's kind of see more of what I mean. 
Um, you might have seen over distance learning period, we had some foundational literacy lessons. So if you had children that were in kindergarten, um, you might have seen some lessons um, being led on our YouTube channel. Um, but I just want to take you through a few activities. Um, I'm not going to do the full um, hand motions activities, but just kind of how you might play with words with your children. Excuse me. So you might work with onset fluency, right? Just the ability to know what sounds um, are at the beginning of words and the initial um, part of a word. So in the word jump, you might ask, what sound do you hear at the beginning of the word jump? And you want your child to reply, J. What sound do you hear at the beginning of fall? F funny. F quick. Qu gum. G. You want them repeating those sounds back to you. Um, and it, please feel free to offer, you know, to do it right along with them so that they hear you providing the model as well. Practice is going to be like our best friends when we're working with these type of, of sound games. But the better, the more students um, engage them, the better that they'll, they'll get. Um, in addition, we might blend some words. So this to adults looks a lot like work with compound words, right? Um, but with your child, it's just by, by sound. So you might say, when I have, um, I have the two words out and side. When you put them together, what's, what word do you have? And they would say outside. Pan cake. Pancake. Now it seems kind of easy when you're doing it as an adult, but it does really take some skill for students to be able to, um, to put these sounds together. Um, fire, man, fireman, or fireman. Also for final sounds. So when we start to get into um, your kinder, um, I saw some folks had kindergarten children or students in kindergarten. When we start to get into like the final sound of words, that can be something that's tricky. Um, why we want phonemic awareness to happen um, absent of letters is that students will focus on the actual sounds that are being made in words. So for the word job, if you're asking for what's the final sound in the word job, you say job and your child will say b. Head. D. Then we get tricky, right? Because we see this word and we say life. And the final sound is not the last letter of the word life, but we would ask them, what's the last sound you hear in the word life? And they would respond for life. With page, don't want them to see the word page. What's the last sound you hear? And that's a tricky one. If they saw it, they might say, oh, it's a G, but them hearing the sound will get them to where we need them to be, which is understanding that in this case, the G says J, like a J. Those activities that I just shared and um, the activities um, that I mentioned would be part of um, our YouTube lessons that we provided all come from, like I mentioned, the Hegarty Phonemic Awareness Curriculum. Um, I want to start off by saying that when I share resources, I do not share anything for you to purchase. But what I would like for you to do is um, to go to the website, and again, you will receive a, a one pager with this information on it, um, to go to the website and they have free COVID e-learning resources. Um, they have an instructional video that supports you in knowing how to support um, your child when going through these activities. And they also have sample lessons, um, many weeks of lessons that can be done. Um, I by no means believe that you need an entire manual. I think the free resources that are available online are enough to get you started in, in thinking through like what might these activities look like for your children. Another helpful resource is as we're playing with sounds, it's really helpful that sounds are created in a very clear manner. So the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy has this wonderful video that goes through the, the 44 um, phonemes of the English language. Um, and basically it's like perfect pronunciation for letters. So what I mean by that is oftentimes when we're pronouncing um, sounds, we add an extra uh to the word. 
and to support students when they start reading and writing, um, the translating these sounds into letters, it's important that we like clip those sounds when we're making them. So for example, B is pronounced B. Um, T is pronounced T and not T. So if a child has learned that T is T, it's very easy that when writing the word cat, they might write C-A-T and they might add like a U-H or an extra um, bit of, of, of letters because they're hearing extra letters. Um, but making very clear um, sounds k, e, t, will support them with both reading and their writing. Again, this link will be shared in the um, other resource document. Most important is building a strong foundation. So during school, students are engaged in foundational literacy activities and very systematic um, phonics instruction. Um, but there are many important skills that can be learned outside of school as well. So using language and conversation, just what you do day to day with your children of answering their questions, of engaging in conversations with them, allowing them to engage in conversations with others, um, siblings, family members, just that supports their language development and will support them when they're reading. Um, listening and responding to stories read out loud. So when you read a story, asking questions about that story, um, I wouldn't say you would go into like a full um, text dependent question mode and, and common core standard mode, but definitely just asking them about what the story, you know, tell, retell the story. Tell me some thoughts um, that you have after reading this. How did you like the book? Things like that support that development too, and also make sure that we're, um, that students are understanding what has been read um, to them. Recognizing and naming the letters of the alphabet. So most likely um, you see on the, the on the PowerPoint that there are some letters. Lots of folks usually have like magnetic letters or, or letters in some way. And, and that's one of the first things um, that children do is learn like the alphabet. Excuse me. Um, after learning the alphabet, you know, usually it's like the, the harder step because everyone can get the song, but the harder step is when we're like identifying um, that those letters have names. And an even harder step is identifying the sounds attached to those, those, letter, those names letters. Um, listening to the sounds of spoken language, doing fun activities kind of like we just um, did, making fun of it, that will support students' development. Um, connecting those sounds to letters um, once they figure out um, the code for reading. In just a bit, I'll share a little bit more about how that might look um, when you're when you're reading with your your children, um, reading often so that it becomes automatic. Um, what really kind of hinders children is when it's not automatic and and reading can seem laborious because every word that I'm encountering I'm having to sound out um, and you know really taking time to decode. So the more students read, the more the more words they're coming in contact with, and the more likely they are to be able to kind of automatically um, decode those words. Learning and using um, new words. So the more words that you that you know, the easier it is when you come um, into contact with those words to be able to decode them because it pulls on your um, on your working memory of, oh wait, I know that word. Um, and then understanding what's read. It can be really frustrating to, you know, spend a lot of time decoding words and then your brain is not able to hold in what was what was read. So really working with students um, and your children on just the basics of, you know, after you read something, you know, what was that about? Um, depending on the child's age, if you start to notice that they don't seem to be holding in that information, you might take smaller breaks. And so instead of at the end of the book asking, you know, what what the book was about, maybe you do it more. Um, towards the middle and then the end, and if it needs to be even smaller chunks than that, you can definitely do that. We can do, um, and in school, you might do summaries or like a, a quick sentence summary of like what has happened, depending on how well students are, are holding that information. Um, so for our um, kindergarten students, really practicing the sounds of language. So this is reading books with rhymes, 
um, teaching them rhymes, reading short poems and, and songs. Um, this is just playing with language, asking you like, how many words can you make that sound like the word bat? And then students kind of go through like, what, what are those? And, and of course you support them with, you know, what those other words are. And you can talk to them about what rhyming words are um, and why words rhyme. Um, helping students, again, playing with words, taking words apart and pull it, putting them back together. You know, it doesn't have to be literally what's in the, the resources that I shared previously. It could be with the word jump. You know, if you have j and ump, put them together, what do they make? Jump. So just playing around with, with the language. Um, practicing the alphabet by pointing at letters. Um, and especially when you see them um, in alphabet books, making sure that they're able to identify what those letters are. Um, it's also a great support for their reading. Um, for your kindergarten and first grade students, um, doing the same thing with the alphabet, but just adding in the, the letter sound relationship. So yes, um, you recognize that this is the letter A, you know, what sound does A make? Um, and you can get to that normal short A, A, sound at this point, um, you know, point point these out on just house, regular household items. So, you know, any labels or boxes, um, newspapers, magazines, signs, um, clothing can have, you know, words on them. Um, you know, I have signs all around my building, um, just pointing out those like where words and letters exist in everyday life. Um, also listening to your child read. Um, being patient as a practice. One thing that I always caution is I never want children um, crying while reading, um, but you also know your children best. So it could be that they are, um, if they're crying because they're frustrated, like they're not able to get through a text, we definitely need to take that down to a, a slightly lower level um, text to make sure that they're able to engage um, in a way that's not frustrating to them. We always want them to be um, engaged and, and happy while reading. That's going to support them to continue to want to read and for reading to be um, a fun activity and not something that, um, you know, they get upset that they do because it is hard. Because remember, it's not something that's natural. It, it takes work. Um, and this is definitely a time where we're building um, those reading muscles um, and skills. For first, um, this is first through third grade, but you know I know it's first through second grade um, parents here. Um, reading familiar books, one of the best ways to gain um, um, reading skills, and this it, this goes even lower for um, kindergarten as well, is sticking with books that in a series. So when students are familiar with characters, they learn character names really quickly. Um, they'll learn like you know the setting, and and they'll pick up on those words. Um, pretty easy and that can be affirming in their um, reading abilities. Um, they'll get really comfortable and if they're rereading um, the same book that also supports their fluency and the, the expression um, while they're reading. Building accuracy. So um, there's definitely a time like in our younger readers it is perfectly okay um, when your child's an emergent reader where they're making it up you know, as they go and they're recognizing, like it's so exciting to see when students recognize that um, print is left to right, even when they aren't um, able to decode the words on the on the text, but just making up the story as they go. Um, but as students progress in their reading skills, it's important that when they're reading that they're accurate. Um, as they get older, they will definitely get to a point. And if you think about your own reading where you your brain is reading so fast that you, you kind of make up the words or you, you know, you're, you're kind of pre-filling the word. But as a young reader, we want to make sure that they're attentive to text and that they're being as um, accurate as possible. Um, if they have to go back and, and sound out a word um, to determine its meaning, um, just make sure that they're sounding it out and they're connecting the letters um, and sounds together. And if it's taking them a while to sound that word out, Ask them to go back and reread the, the sentence. Um, you can see, like, are they able to hold that information or do they need to like, go back and reread it um, so that they're able to get the, the meaning of the text? Um, building their comprehension. Text talks are so big. 
Um, I always like to think of like, what do you do after you finish reading a book? Um, and those are the kind of things that we we should do um, when working with children. And so talk to your child about, you know, what they're reading. If it's a book out like that you're not reading with them, um, ask them if they've, you know, found any new words, um, what's happened in the story. You can ask them to retell the story. Um, talk about characters and places, um, the events. I love to talk about problem and solution um, in books. Um, if it's a nonfiction book, what what's something new that you learned from the book? You know, can you show me where you found that information? Draw their um, attention to pictures and um, captions in nonfiction books. Um, also encourage them to read on their own. Um, I think that's one of those things that um, they'll see when they um, hopefully that they see you doing at home and that that is an activity that yes can be shared but also can be done independently making reading part of just every day so during meal times um you know walking walking somewhere you know just making sure that children are learning new words um, meal times and recipes are really like they're going to get so many words that they don't encounter in text um, from recipes that you may have um, from, you know, their folks that like read the ingredients um, on on different food packaging. Um, you can think about like that as also being somewhere where words can be found. Um, just any time that you're able to provide them with like new words and opportunities would be wonderful. Um, reading together every day. So talk about stories, pictures, and words. And then being an advocate, I am positive you already do this, but make sure, you know, be informed about how they're progressing in reading. Ask the teacher, like, are there ways that you can um, help? What kind of activities are they doing inside of the classroom um, that you can also support with at home? If it's consistent and it's happening in school and it's happening at home, the skills are going to be easier um, picked up by your child or more easily picked up by your child. Also being a reader and writer yourself. So um, I'm, I'm always and I will always, I think, share growing up. Um, I saw my mom and my grandmother as my models for um, just reading. And so I would see them reading all the time. My mother's still um, a, a great reader um, and reads all the time. And so just that example, like I didn't know like anything else. And I know it's a completely different time um, from way back then, but I didn't know that there was like any other thing else. Like there was TV, yeah, but like I could go and read a book by myself and, and find enjoyment in that. So just sharing that example um, is another way that you can um, support your child with, with reading. And then visiting the library. This isn't necessarily possible. I saw that there are going to be some libraries that are um, opening. I'm not sure if they're are currently open, but there's many um, resources available digitally that I'll share in, um, in just a moment. And so those activities, um, I know previously there were like story times that were available um, and different activities that they, they were using to engage uh, with families. So I wanted to take you through um, the resources that we have um, that can support um, you with literacy and how to support your child. So on our DCPS YouTube channel, um, these are the foundational literacy videos that I um, spoke of. They're called Fun with Phonics, if that helps you narrow them down. Um, and they're video lessons from kindergarten, first and second grade. And the learning covers from the time, from about April actually, so I'm gonna say the time that we got out, but about April until late May. So end of um, end of kindergarten to end of second grade is about the period, but at the beginning of every kindergarten lesson is that Hegarty lesson. So um, the brief activities that I took you through in the beginning, those lessons can be found at the beginning of every kindergarten lesson um, and just really support the um, that phonemic awareness development that'll support the letter to sound connection um, and make it easier for children to, to decode words. Again, about the public library, um, they have the Read 20 Challenge again, um, summer summer challenge again this summer. Um, so reading 20 minutes a day, um, students and, and every member of the family actually is able to get um, 
you know, a prize for participating in the challenge. I always, um, at the end of the day, we do want students um, and children to be intrinsically motivated to read. So that we want it to come from inside and that it's enjoyable, so I want to do it. But sometimes we need to get the extrinsic too, right? So sometimes you need to know how fun reading is and it might take like a little, you know, something to get you um, to, to enjoy reading. So that's one way that you might um, engage with reading with your child this summer. Um, and you can also take part as well. Um, there's also lots of video storybooks available at the library. This is one of my um, favorite um, uh, things that is available at the, the library. We also actually use some of these um, in our curriculum themselves. I'm gonna tell you a little secret. Um, they have the digital uh, storybooks um, called Tumble Books. And Tumble Book Library has uh, one of my favorite books by <laughs> Robert Munch called Stephanie's Ponytail. Now, depending, I would watch it first because um, I'm not sure about like maturity level um, of your children. It is great for early for early um, students, but what I like most is it shows kind of how like engaging reading can be and um, the narrator really provides um, just, you know, you just want to read more. And so love those video storybooks. There's also book flicks. We use a lot of book flicks. Um, in our curriculum. You'll also, with book flicks, you'll have a, a fiction and a nonfiction pairing um, of books. And lots of those books are um, in a K2 range. So your children would be able to read them um, independently and along with you as well. Um, Overdrive has lots of books. They're not necessarily in a, um, I feel like the book flicks and, and tumble books are definitely like storybooks. Overdrive has like the whole, um, array of, of text. So video storybooks at this time where it's, you know, hard to, to get like a library book and also, I don't know if you're like me, like very, um, got a touch of the germaphobe. Um, so don't necessarily want to touch, um, like share things right now, but that would be a great resource for your home. I've also linked um, the Hegarty um, link. This particular link will take you to a video um, of the instructions of how to do Haggerty if you wanted to add the, the hand motions. Um, I would try it with your children. They might have seen um, these hand motions and they might be able to teach you some. Um, reading Rockets. Reading Rocket, Rockets is like a treasure trove of literacy resources. Um, these resources are parent facing in this um, for this link. Um, there's also ones that if you really want to dive deep into um, into like reading and, and learning more about it. Um, they also have some teacher modules that you might wanna watch with videos. Um, previously in our early slide and in the, in the link that I'll share, there, there's also more information about the learning to read um, where it talks about like where, um, where your brain lights up when you're reading. So if you really wanna dig deeper into how children learn to read and understanding that, these are definitely resources that, that I um, suggest for you. At the end of the day, when engaging with your children with reading, always remember that reading should be fun. To keep them motivated, to keep them engaged, it just should be something that's fun to do and not necessarily like a chore. Um, so if you notice it becoming a little bit chorish, um, you know, go to those resources that'll help make it more fun. Um, the tips that'll make it more fun, um, video storybooks that are, are fun and silly, like um, Robert Munch. Um, there's also um, Enemy Pie that I think that may be a little second grade-ish. Um, just think about like, how can I make this more fun um, for my child so that they develop a, a lifelong love of, of reading. Now I wanna jump into the Q&A. So if there's questions, I'm gonna look to see what has, um, what has been posted. And if, if there's any questions that you have for me, um, please let me know and I can answer them live now. Hey, Emily, it's Taylor. Hey, Taylor. Hey, so we had a question, um, especially like now with technology, um, folks uh, doing reading on their computers, their phones, their tablets. Um, is is that okay in, in terms of like how you can like communicate the importance of 
reading with your child um or does it have to be like a like a book book <laughs> i i love this question taylor um so i i'm only a few years removed from like we should read with books um reading is reading i know it um there i there's like die hard um you have to feel the papers, uh, the, the pages on your fingers to be able to engage in a book. But reading is reading and we get the same joy. It's just how we're accessing um, the resources. I would think of it as like um, how you might engage with newspaper articles. Um, it's been a real long time besides things like during uh, Thanksgiving and I wanna get the sales paper that I've like purchased a newspaper, but I get a lot of that through um, my phone and I get the same information. Um, I do think you're going to want to, you know, provide that experience of um, reading, the left to right directionality, the being able to hold a book, um, you know, properly. But they can get the same like information. They can decode and do all of that um, on a digital device as well. Um, so yes, there's definitely I, I will say like I, I have got like I do read digital books too, but. Um, at the end of the day, I really, um, it reading will be reading and students will learn to read um, on e using either. Cool. Um, another question, oh, we have some questions pop up. Um, let's see. Um, how can you get a child engaged if they have ADHD or autism? How do you recommend that? Yes, um, choice. I, students um, and children need to choose the books that they like. Um, recommend also like series. Sometimes it's gonna be, um, you know, I guess like kind of measure your expectations of what a reading session will be. So you might not start with like, hey, we're going to read for an hour. Like, you know, you want to build up to um, them being able to read for longer periods of time. So if they're able to read for five minutes with you, then let's have them read for five minutes. And then after they get used to like that five minute time, like let's up it, depending on like how um, they're feeling about the books. But choice will make a huge difference in, um, in their reading. Um, I, I want to also connect this to um, the the question about epic. Um, it is fine to have students read aloud. Um, I always I like to link things to like how you might engage to think about like your child as a reader because we're all readers and we all it lots of things are um, kind of choices and preferences. So and this also connects to the. Um, like engaging um, if you have a child that has ADHD or, um, or autism. So when it, when I read, um, I often like to read, you know, silently by myself, but there are also times that I want to like read along with something. So it'd be nice to have something that I can listen to. Um, depending on my confidence in, in the reading, I might, um, you know, want to hear a word that's that's being read. Um, early readers definitely can have that example. Um, and as I shared, like sometimes it's like really lively. Um, you know, read alouds. You'll see some read alouds that um, your your children's teachers might might do, and they're like so lively. And then you might engage in read alouds, and it's like, oh, it's kind of you know all one tone and not the most fun. Um, so those read alouds that are available digitally are usually pretty great. Um, and you can also toggle in between if it's being read aloud and and not. Um, so I would just monitor it. You, I don't think you want everything being read aloud because you want them to to demonstrate that they're able to decode it independently. Um, but I would definitely allow them to to engage in it too. Awesome. Another one that I see is, is who in the school can help my child with reading? Who in the school? Um, so the first person that you would go to is your um, child's teacher. Um, and then you can see, you can ask like, is there a, a reading specialist? Um, is there any tutoring that's offered? Um, and um, it kind of depends. There's usually a few factors that determine if um, services can be 
um, provided for um, for your child, like a like a reading specialist or any interventionist, um, or if they have like a reading partner um, in the building. But I would definitely discuss those options with your child's teacher um, of who can, might be able to support. Cool. Thanks, Emily. Uh, another another question that I have, although I do want to shout out Sarah, who's one of those diehard, uh, good old fashioned book folks. I see you, Sarah. Um, one of the questions that I have um, is, what what if you suspect that the book that your child chooses might be like a little bit too hard, or what if it's a little bit too easy? How can you um, support your child in choosing a book that might speak more to their skills or maybe interests? I know that there's also a debate on that as well. Yeah, I would say like if it's a, a one-off or a few that I love allowing access to books that children want to read. Um, so if it's too hard, I would, you know, approach that as like, let's read this book together and let's, you know, choose like who's going to read what, um, depending on their age. Like if they're going to read like a sentence or, you know, a paragraph or like what they what they kind of take over. Um, sometimes when we get into um, reading, you know, good old chapter books, um, some parents do like a, a page by page. Um, then we might do like chapters, but it just kind of depends on. Um, well, let me not say it depends. I would never say don't read books with children. Um, if it's too easy, that's it's you don't want them to have too easy books all the time, um, but you do want to, to provide them with practice. So if they want to read it, I would say, you know, great, go ahead. But we do want to also make sure, you know, things are challenging um, for children. Um, I'm not going to tell you to stick to the, you know, the level um, text that are sent home. Um, we want to be able to provide children with choice um, and access to books that they want to read. Like the biggest, um, the biggest push, like especially for at home, is is students practicing with books that they want to read on all various levels. So yes, easy. Yes, you know, a little more difficult with support. Um, and then those books that they can read independently. Like all access to all of those um, is great practice for students. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think I'm not seeing any additional questions. Is there anything that you want to share one last quick tip about? Um, I'm not certain. Like I said, um, you know, if you want to dig deeper um, into the resources, there's plenty of resources out there on um, how to, um, you know, best support your child with reading. I've linked a few in the resources that will be shared. Um, I really do thank you for your uh, participation today and your engagement. Um, I've shared my email on, um, on the screen. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I also appreciate that um, you all joined us um, after school's out. Um, that's, that's pretty awesome um, and that you're gonna continue this work over um, the summer with your children. I saw one new one might have popped up. I'm not sure what it is. Um, yes. So if it, if that so the question is um, if a child wants to read the same book every time, you're like, what do you do? Especially I'm a child with autism. Um, I, I have a colleague that um, has her son. He asked for the same book um, all the time. And my suggestion was, is it possible that there's another um, that there's another book that, you know, has the same characters or has the same, um, you know, theme or topic? And what I would say is I would I would say don't not read that book, but like, can we add another book to that so we can read, you know, the book that you want to read all the time and let's read another book as well. Um, so just trying to see if we can add. Um, to the books, and if not, just adding in um, similar characters, similar um, topics to support and see how that how that does. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. I really appreciate it. Um, 
for the sake of time and this this is uh informational for me i'm i'm really excited to to test this out as a uh as a parent when the time comes so i really appreciate it um emily touched on some resources that were shared um, you can find those resources um, at the bit.ly link, uh, bit.ly backslash parent you early lit. Um, and so that will have the PDF of today's presentation as well as a one pager with all of the links and resources that, that Emily mentioned. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and I will be referring to that later and feel free to, to download it, to use it. Um, let us know when you do use it uh, because we we want to want to know like that our resources are helping you all on a similar note we'd like to know how we did uh whether or not you'd like to see more workshops like this um so if you could let us know either really quickly in the chat on a scale of one to five how we did one saying like you all totally missed the mark and five being like oh my goodness when is the next one uh this was perfect uh, we would love to get your insight on that um another or uh what would really help uh, especially as you share um the types of workshops that you'd like to participate in as especially as as families of some of our our youngest learners if you could uh, visit the uh, bit.ly link to take a quick survey uh, bit bit.ly backslash parent you eval 19 and that way you can uh, share deeper insight about your experience with uh, parent you today and then if you have more ideas or questions uh, feel free to email the parent you uh, email address parent you at k12.dc.gov i'm really excited uh, i look i always check the the box to make sure that we're answering folks questions um but I really want to thank Emily today, who has just been absolutely phenomenal. I'm about to take these tips, like I said. Um, and thank you to my partner in crime, Jerry. Uh, and thank you to our moderators, Brianna and Elizabeth, who have just been amazing at answering your questions. And um, hopefully uh, you all have been able to, to learn something today as well. If you are like, oh, well, what, what else does a uh, parent you have? Uh, we have uh, a slew of workshops available on YouTube of past recordings. Uh, feel free to check them out. Uh, let us know what you think. Um, again, and, and thank you all so much. And you all are doing an amazing job at keeping your kids engaged, uh, help, helping them learn. My daughter wants to be engaged right now. Um, but and and to keep pushing them and challenging them and and sharing new ideas with them and so when you participate in workshops like this you are just going above and beyond uh, parenting a lot can can feel a lot like making things up as you go along and trusting your gut and googling the rest and and you all are doing an amazing job uh, raising your children so congratulations have a great afternoon hug those kiddos and we look forward to seeing you in the fall.